Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome, and thanks for tuning in to our Zoom Art Talk with Kenneth Tan and Travis Steele. My name is Asuka Hisa, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at ICALA. We just opened Silent Spikes, so actually this is the first chance to hear from Kenneth Tam, who's based on the East Coast. And I couldn't think of a nicer way of doing this than to have it be a conversation between two old friends. Uh, Silent Spikes is on view as a gorgeous two-channel installation in our project room. The first solo installation uh, the first solo institutional presentation in Los Angeles is organized by ICALA senior curator Jamila James. Silent Spikes was originally commissioned by the Queens Museum and shown there earlier this year. In fact, it closed um, sort of right when ours opened. And in addition, a version appeared all over Times Square around midnight each night in June, and that was in partnership with Times Square Arts and Queens Museum. And there's more. If you happen to be driving along the five in LA in the last couple of months, you could also see silence, a Silent Spikes billboard installation with the text by curator Astria Superak declaring, Asians have been here longer than cowboys. We'll get into all of this in a minute through an exploration of Kenneth's work. I'm going to briefly go over their bios. Um, we'll be posting their full uh, elaborate bios in the chat for you. Um, so here we go. Kenneth Tam works in video, sculpture, and photography using the male body as a starting point for discussion about performance, physical intimacy, vulnerability, and private ritual. Tam received his BFA from Cooper Union in New York and his MFA from the University of Southern California. Travis Deal is a writer, editor, and freelance critic. He has lived in Los Angeles since 2009, although right now he's not in Los Angeles in Idaho. Uh, he's a regular contributor to Freeze, Art Agenda, Art in America, Extra, and Contemporary Art Review Los Angeles, and has contributed to Art Forum, Aperture, the Los Angeles Review of Books, among others. There's more in the, in the bio that'll be in the chat. He's a recipient of the Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant in 2013, and the Rabkin Prize in Visual Arts Journalism in 2018 and he's currently online editor at Extra. The two of them will be in conversation. I will sort of disappear into the background. I want, you to, I want to remind you to feel free to make comments in the chat, but ask your questions in the Q&A box so we know which ones are questions and I will return so that we can address any questions at the end of this talk. Uh, Kenneth Tam Silent Spikes was organized by the Queens Museum and made possible with the support uh, from the Asian Art Circle at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York. ICALA is supported by the Curators Council, Fieldwork, and the 1717 Collective. And feel free to support us at any level. It keeps us going as places like ours want to keep going to provide you with this caliber of art, critical thought, and discussion. Right now, we're open to the public by appointment Wednesday through Sunday with later hours until 7 p.m. on Thursdays. And currently on view are Queer Communion, Ron Athey, a retrospective of the singular Los Angeles-based performance artist. The show is curated by Amelia Jones, and of course, Kenneth Tam, Silent Spikes. Thanks for joining. I'm gonna now leave it to Travis and Ken. Thanks, Oscar. Um, hi, Ken. Hi, hi Travis. Um, I thought we would start with the kind of history behind the piece, both as a way to kind of describe the, the subject matter, um, but also the particular historical, I guess, framework or event that the piece centered around, which is the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad um, and specifically a labor strike of uh, Chinese railroad workers on June 24th, 1867. Um, curious what drew you to the larger story of um, Chinese immigrant labor in the railroad and that strike in particular. Um, yeah, sure. Um, 
before that, before I answer that, I just wanted to to, to mention that uh, I think you and I both actually met while we were working as preparators at the Autry Museum. I think that's <laughs> kind of like a really wonderful, um, not so arbitrary fact, uh, given the some of the, the themes and images that I'm working on in, uh, with Silent Spike. So um, I just thought that like, however that experience, yeah, being in that in that space, I don't know if that yeah. is, is too neat in terms of like our, our conversation today, but it, it did happen. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's definitely, it's yeah, it's in, it's in there. It's it made an impression. <laughs> Um, definitely, and, and that, you know, I haven't even been back, I haven't been back to that museum since we worked there. Um, but in terms of the uh, your question about what drew me to the history, I think that um, that that the history itself, that incident, that particular strike, wasn't even the impetus to the project. You know, it actually came about when I was just researching in general uh, uh, the history of, 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 of Chinese immigrant labor in the West specifically uh, while working on the Transcontinental Railroad. And I think I just happened to stumble upon this new story about the strike, which is not very well known, um, much about the, uh, the construction of the railroad, at least from the perspective of the workers themselves, is, is not very well known. There's very little extant uh, evidence um, about that, that particular experience. Um, and so when I first read about it, I was really kind of struck that it happened at all. Um, and, and in particular, the way it happened and the sort of the scale of, of this labor strike, which is uh, uh, quite large um, and almost unthinkable, given the sort of, let's say, the lack of, of resources for, for the, uh, the individuals that participated. Um, so, you know, it was, it, was, it was a strike that happened um, Along most of the entire line, um, uh, uh, about let's say like 25 miles um, of, 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 of of railroad construction um, halted for about a week, and um, it was one of the first instances of of a mass labor strike, um, you know, in this country uh, at all, and so much is. So little, excuse me, is known about how they even how these workers organize, how they're able to communicate along these great distances, um, and what made them even do this, or like what gave them the sort of the courage to um, um, band together, right? Because these men came from very different parts of of China. It, it was not just you know people would that would naturally find affinities with each other, um, let alone um, defy you know their sort of their bosses, management, the, the, you know, the railroad company in such um, such a flagrant way, I guess. So, so yeah, the, just the circumstances and the, and the, imp the impossibility of this really struck me, made an impression. Yeah, I'm curious if you have a sense of how. I mean, you said it's not very well documented, but did you do you have a sense of how the strike was organized or? I, I really don't. Um, from what I've read, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe there is um, evidence of this, but there was no, there's no like actual written documentation as to how um, these men even sort of, you know, communicated down the line that this was going to happen. Um, it was a total surprise to the railroad company, right? They didn't know, they had no warning that this was going to happen. So however they planned it, they were able to, to keep, keep it a secret, um, which probably wasn't that difficult given the sort of the fact that they can communicate in another language. Um, mm -hmm. But even so, I think that, um, yeah, there's, there's very little known as to how this is actually organized and what there, if there was even a leader, um, what the structure was for, for, or, for this organization. Um, they, you know, they were demanding better working conditions, um, increased wages, um, fewer work days, fewer work hours per day. Um, but, but other than that, you know, it wasn't necessarily clear what else they hoped to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to ask about the the narration and maybe just also the overall like lyricism of the video, 
which to me, I mean, talking about this like lack of documentation, lack of written history about the events surrounding the video or the events that the video is kind of pinned to, um, that kind of absence of specifics relates in some way to the, the lyricism or the abstraction of some of the imagery in the video and especially the, the narration, um, especially which is um, this kind of collective voice somehow. Um, it's not really an individual or it blurs that, that idea of like individual and collective. Um, so yeah, I wanted, I wanted to ask about your thinking behind the narration, um, the text is drawn from anywhere. Um, and, what, and and how you arrived at that form, that form basically of the lyric voiceover to intersperse. Yeah. Um, I mean, all of that whole component of this video is actually quite new to my work, right? Like, I think that I've, been, I've never sort of adopted a fictionalized or semi fictionalized voice before. Um, work has never really kind of gone into that kind of space and even even the sort of the historical component is, is rather new that's not something that uh, any of my other projects have really explicitly staked out or um, investigated um, but I knew that I wanted to bring in this history into the project but not in a way that was in any way documentary um, it was not about it, it wasn't necessarily even about like excavating this thing and making him more known as a kind of corrective gesture, like, hey, everyone should know more about this. I mean, they should, but that's, that wasn't necessarily why I brought it into, uh, into the mix. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think that the, you know, you point out the lyricism of, of the voice of the voiceover, which I think was, uh, was really important as a way to kind of, um, maybe not to undermine the, 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 ver the, 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 the historical veracity of what the, the voice is saying, but to um, create a different way of, in which we would understand these, these individuals, these, these more or less nameless individuals that history has only sort of um, acknowledged in, in, in the margins or in a kind of perfunctory paragraph about you know, the railroad and its construction and things like that. Um, I wanted, um, I, I knew I wanted to reference uh, 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 this incident and one of the people that was involved in it um, but in a way that wasn't just about them and their, wasn't explicitly understood within a frame of labor, let's say, and, and, and toil and hardship, even though that is there, it's mm -hmm. inescapable. I wanted to, you know, really kind of give the audience um, a way to feel perhaps what it was like to be in that body, right? So much of the video is about a certain kind of bodily affect and, um, and, and um, it was an attempt to think about how these individuals are not just units of disposable labor, which is typically how they're characterized, um, but to really sort of give it a poetic, um, you know, sensuous uh, a quality, which I was hoping to achieve through that voiceover. Yeah. Yeah, sen sensuous is, is also a big, um, I mean, a good word. I wanna talk more about the, the tunnel in particular, I mean, there's so much like sensuality to the way the tunnel is shot and depicted. Um, but before, before we go there, maybe you could describe who the four men are in the video. And um, I know in the past you've had different ways of recruiting your uh, participants and, um, you know, what, what sort of parameters there were to the, to the, the call or the casting or whatever, um, and then just the way that they, um, just the way that you uh, arrange their, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, activities, or they're, they're kind of like um, tasks or something, I don't know, prompts maybe. Yeah, there's prompting, there's tasking, um, activating. Um, yeah, then actually there were five, five different men that I worked with throughout the project. Um, but they were found in, in kind of more or less the same way in which I've been working um, up until now. You know, Craigslist is still a go-to resource, but I was also using various um, casting websites 
this time, not because I was looking for actors. I'm never really interested in working with actors, um, but just because it opened up a larger sort of, let's say, applicant pool to, to draw from. Um, the shoot, you know, took place over a very long period of time. Not, not that we were working often, but I knew that I needed the people that I was working with to, to commit to it. And so on a very practical level, um, actors seem to have that kind of experience and <laughs> I guess responsibility or, to, or dedication or commitment to a project. And so, so I, I looked for, you know, so I, I was able to find uh, a good number of the participants through various kinds of casting sites. But at the beginning, I wasn't, you know, screening them based on their acting ability. Um, that was never really, that has never been um, something I've been interested in. Um, but rather, you know, I was looking for, for, for people that were just interested or even just curious about what I was doing and could make time in their lives for, for this project. Mm -hmm. and so, so some of them, you know, and even if they were actors, they were just starting out. They didn't have necessarily that much experience. Um, I don't think I could ever work with an actor that was like, you know, really formally trained or had, had you know, come in and like expect to give a certain kind of performance. That's not what I'm interested in. Yeah, I guess also what I'm curious about is if there's a particular um, if one of the parameters or requirements was, it was, was the participants having a relationship, a personal engagement with the material of the project in a way that to me, it like seems to go beyond some of the previous projects where the parameter is like just being a man or something like <laughs> that, right? And just sort of like um, men's group type activities, but there's, um, this is kind of a more charged, more specific um, project. Yeah, for sure. There are definitely a few more boxes that they had to check in order to sort of qualify. Um, I mean, I definitely, you know, over the course of these different projects, you know, the the the, the amount that I can share with people, at, you know, at the beginning has has grown, and um, and so like I actually like presented them with a whole sort of pre-production thing of like this is what I want to do, and it's what it's about, and where it'll end up, and. Um, and of course, all of that sort of got upended when the pandemic started. Um, so, um, but but um, that's all still to say that I, I try to prepare them as much as I could, um, but in a way that again, emphasized that there were no rehearsals, there's no script. Most of what you're gonna be doing is improvised. Um, you're gonna be working with people in ways that might, you know, Make you uncomfortable or, or, or challenge you, you know, in, in, in more or less harmless ways. But um, that's all part of, of what I'm trying to capture on camera. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they had to be game for that. And, and certainly, you know, this project also clearly hinges on identity, right? So they had to sort of, fit, you know, they, they, these were individuals that were um, self identifying as Asian American men, um, whatever that meant to them, right? which you know that term is, is quite nebulous and open-ended so um that's that's another sort of thing with this project yeah i'm going to try to find sharing my screen i'm trying to find a shot of these guys right so this is four out of the five i mean this is, yeah it was really like yeah i guess it's but it's a four um Kind of a, I don't know, kind of a touching this like group portrait I thought was like one of the most touching scenes in a way because they're like, I don't know. It felt kind of, I'm not sure what order you shot things in, but it felt like a, a conclusion or some kind of, I don't know, like a, a farewell or something like that. I mean, it's not at the end, it's not at the end of the, the loop either, but. Um, Well, I, I can say that this was the second group shoot that we did. We shot this in February of 2020. So about a month before um, the pandemic started. Um, uh, it, it definitely wasn't a farewell, you know, when we were doing this, but perhaps, you know, in hindsight, there was a sort of, I don't yeah. know, an act of finality. Um, but, but yeah, this was the second time they all got together, or at least, you know, four out of five of them got together. Um, let's see. Uh, 
So here's the tunnel. I think mm -hmm. maybe this may be like one of the later, or like this is kind of the part where it starts to loop. Um, like reach the end of the tunnel in one spot and are starting over in the other spot on the other screen. Um, I guess maybe you, you could say a little bit about what the tunnel is, what how it's significant, but also um, I think the way it's used in the film as a not only a location um, and a, a subject for the, the voiceover, they talk about being in the tunnel and the sensuousness of the rock and this passage from one end of the tunnel to the other. Um, also just like structurally, the way the the video, the two channels are organized um, is as a kind of as a kind of loop where pushing through this tunnel like over and over is the kind of is also a kind of structuring device. Um, yeah, I was curious to hear your thoughts about um, how, how all of that like comes together, how all those different ways of structuring the piece like come together in this it's like location, this one very specific, uh, I mean, almost um, maybe haunted is too strong a word, but a very like, significant like piece of ground. Yeah, I mean, um, the tunnel was always going to be significant. Uh, I did a site visit out there in uh, 2019. It's 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 in the Sierra Nevadas, about an, um, it's near it's near uh, Lake Tahoe, right? So Northern California. Um, it's very accessible by car. Um, it's 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 open. Anyone can can get to it. You park your car. You walk. You know, 15, 20 minutes up a kind of a semi steep. Uh, uh, rocky uh, mountainside and you're there. And um, as soon as I stepped in it, you know, I knew the historical significance um, and there are, you know, some didactic texts that kind of alert people to the history of this. And there's many different histories there actually. Um, but um, as soon as I stepped in this particular stretch of tunnel, it, it was very overpowering, right? It's, um, yes, it's just like a big hole in, in the ground. Um, but you know, you want you, you you if you know the history, then you realize that this was carved out without any um, power tools, right? It was it was all done by hand in dynamite, um, and it's a very it's a pretty vast space, you know. Um, definitely brought to mind um, certain land artworks, let's say like like Michael Heiser's Double Negative or something. You know, it has a sort of um, I don't know this overwhelming bodily sort of response or you know that's that's how I felt when I was in there and um you know originally I was actually going to not just film the tunnel but bring my participants out there fly them out there and, and do something in the, in the tunnel I wasn't sure what exactly but I knew that we were going to shoot in that space um unfortunately that didn't happen because of, of the pandemic um but I was still able to get this really kind of beautiful floaty tracking shot through you know straight through the the space and for me you know i think the tunnel has a has a number of different sort of meanings behind it you know certainly it it, it sort of grounds um the project with this sort of historical event um, and and i should say that the, the strike didn't happen just in the tunnel it happened over 25 miles so this is just one site in which the, the strike you know uh, occurred um, but I, I, I thought it was important to kind of understand that the struggles that these men were facing at that time um, should not be thought of as distinct or um, disconnected from, say, the experience of, of other Asian Americans in the present day. Um, I wanted to kind of connect these dis disparate moments in, in time and space and see that these things sort of function on a continuum and the, and the tunnel or the movement through the tunnel was a kind of a great visual metaphor for, um, for yeah, for, for connecting different points in time. Um, yeah, it's like passing through, I think at one point the voiceover even said something like, this is, I can travel through time or across time and space using right. this as a portal or something like that, like, yeah. Absolutely, the way in which, um, a physical space, even devoid of any historical markings or whatnot, can can 
you know, transport you to something to sort of, um, I don't know, like when I, again, when I was in there, I had this very physical response um, that, that really took, t made me sort of think about that history that really sort of, um, you know, made a very powerful impression upon me about these bodies toiling in here against this, you know, really Im against this sort of uh, impossible material to, to work with, the sort of grinding out, uh, hollowing out of this mountain, which just seems so incredible um, if you actually try to imagine the mechanics of that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, that quality I wanted to convey in the video. And then, you know, the more I was looking at this footage, you know, the, the void, you know, I was just thinking of like, what else is the void? What else is a whole, you know, the, the sort of, um, what other meanings can it take? And I think that something as formless as a tunnel, um, it, it, it started to, you know, in comparison with like the cowboy imagery, right, which is so significant in the rest of the video, you know, how do those two things, what, 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 what do those things have to do with one another? And I think for me, if we think of the cowboys as very sort of like well delineated, sort of um, maybe even like overwrought character filled mm -hmm. with meaning um, that we all sort of recognize, um, and then the tunnel is something that like has is, is formless, is shapeless, um, is not defined at all in a certain way, or at least when you're in it and you're sort of overwhelmed by this sort of black space. Um, thinking about the ways in which the tunnel can, can sort of um, open up certain performances, let's say, or at least like sort of bring into tension what the cowboy represents and, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like well-determined um, orthodoxy, let's say, yeah. and all the things that it symbolizes. Like wide open space and freedom and all that stuff. Um, yeah, and, and also someone else pointed out that it was interesting that, you know, so much of this project is, is situated in the West, but then we don't get these typical Western sort of open expanses, right? Like all I show you is this like under sub subterranean hole. And so yeah. that is also like an interesting kind of contrast. Yeah, and I wonder where the, the, the sensual aspect of the, the piece in general, but, but kind of the tunnel specifically, I mean, there's a really like effective passage where the narrator is pressing his body against what I imagine is like the end of the tunnel as it's built and it's not drilled through yet. So there's this kind of rock barrier, but then there's more tunnel on the other side. And you imagine someone on the other side pressing against the rock and coming into this kind of contact like through the mountain. Um, I wonder if your own experience in the tunnel, like being there physically, um, and viewed the piece of that like sensual dimension um and just the way i mean yeah just just the way that that aspect of the tunnel which again is not something you know you, you typically associate with like a ro rock or like um kind of engineering projects right there's this very physical bodily like you know sensual dimension and then there's also like so many um point like sensual moments in the the acting or the um the performances of the participants too um, so i'm wondering how the, that how that came about and how you are kind of relating those those two uh kind of areas of the, the video yeah i think well i when i was in the tunnel i definitely did not press my body against the rocks and <laughs> think about that i think i was a little like terrified actually it was, it was Kind of like perfect sublime moment where I was both terrified but also drawn to the space. And you know, when I was in there, when you, you know you get to a certain point, it's pitch black. You can't even see what you're stepping on. You can't really see what's in front of you except for that you know kind of pinhole of light at the other end. And so you know there is, yeah, for, you know I, I'm someone that doesn't really like being in dark spaces like that. So it was challenging, but I, at the same time, like it, you know it there was a kind of attraction I had to, to the awesomeness of the space. Um, and then also, you know, when I was safely back home and thinking about the voiceover, I was also trying to imagine, well, what does this space feel like when it's filled with people, right? These, these, these laborers, it wasn't just one solitary figure hammering away, it was, it was you know, hundreds of people perhaps at any given point, um, all crammed together in the space, perhaps quite dark. Um, 
working, you know, in, with, with sort of the single focus determination and trying to imagine, you know, again, the, the, af, the effective experience of, of, of that kind of situation and, and not necessarily to explore the, the erotics of that, even though I think that certainly is a part of the project, but just trying to articulate that, that experience um, and how, how that could also complicate um, the way we, we understand or the, the identities of these individuals um, and how we can perhaps complicate ideas about labor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the way also that labor kind of complicates the idea of the individual. I mean, the voiceover I think mentions, you know, the strike failed as a as a strike, as a labor action, but it also it succeeded in creating this new, this like sense of collective identity um, along along the line. Um, yeah, which again, I mean the cow the cowboy as a figure is sort of individual, individualistic or something. Um, I do want to ask about the the cowboy. I mean, one thing that you you notice in the video is just how like clean their outfits are. I mean, it's very much um, a costume, right, and not not the kind of like literal like workwear of a, a cowboy or whatever. It's like also in in its reality a kind of dirty, thankless, hard job, um, low paid, blah, blah blah. But it does have this like mythology to it. Um, which is actually what is being acted out here, right? It's not, it's not, again, that sort of historical recreation of that reality. It's more of a, um, a habitation of that myth, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about like this, this shot in particular, maybe you could just talk about um, with the setup, I mean, there's several shots where the participants are, or it seems like you've asked them to, to dance like they're on a bronco or a bull or something like that. So there's very like, um, and sort of lyrical like movements, um, where they're miming being on a, yeah, like riding in a rodeo or something. Um, but then there's this one shot in, in particular where, um, you have, this guy behind the guy in the back is um, looks like he's he's making a motion with that looks like he's pumping like a hand cart like a rail railroad cart, um, and there's two there's sort of two versions right like one where you've zoomed out and you can see like the mechanics of this like sort of bull bull machine and one and then other shots where or another sequence where you can't and it's zoomed in. Um, so yeah, I, wanna, I wanted to ask if you could just talk about the setup of that shot and in particular, why those two framings and how you see those two framings operating like um, sort of against each other, like informing each other. Yeah, um, so the device is drawn from uh, rodeo bull riding culture, let's say it's, it's called a, a drop barrel, which is basically just a homemade contraption to, you know, simulate being on, on a bull, someone, sometimes it's one person, maybe sometimes it's like multiple people like sort of uh, uh, pushing the, the lever uh, behind you. And um, that was something that I, you know, the whole bull riding culture was not something I had any familiarity with, but um, I sort of stumbled on that um, at some point in my YouTube research, and I was just really drawn to the movement. I was really drawn to um, not the movement on the actual bull, which is you know very violent, um, erratic, and and quite cruel, really, right? When you see that, but the way in which uh, uh, when the men are practicing, and it's, it's mostly men, there are some women, but it's, it's a majority. You know, it's a very um, intensely masculine kind of activity. Um, when they practice, when they build these things, you know, and there's something about this movement um, that I thought was quite beautiful, actually. Um, uh, you know, certainly the the way in which both both men have to sort of work in tandem to to to, to you know work the the drop barrel of this contraption, but even you know having to like move one's hips to be able to counteract the force 
of the bull or the barrel in this situation. And I knew I wanted to sort of incorporate that movement somehow, um, but to reveal again, these more you know, sensuous qualities about it um, in some way. So I, you know, I think that uh, ended up with these two particular framings. And the reason why I, I did one that was slightly wider and one that was more close up was, um, I thought the wider ones, you know, those are interesting. This one, for example, with Theo, um, it was interesting to see the how you know to get a sense of the mechanics, um, but it also felt a bit too heroic. Um, even though there is a kind of absurdity to it, I think that's something that the whole project sort of plays with. There's a certain humor, self-deprecating humor. Um, but the one with Tyler, the one that's more punched in, um, right. was was you know definitely had a different effect because when you see it, you're not exactly sure what what's happening there. Um, and certainly uh, Alfred, the person behind them is doing this motion. And there is a definite like sort of homoerotic kind of <laughs> pumping action going on there. Um, but then you, you, you watch Tyler's face, right? I think this shot allows you to see his face more. And he, you know, there's a certain kind of uncertainty that he goes through uh, during the sequence, which isn't that long, would be like 20 or 30 seconds where the camera holds on him. Um, there are moments where he feels, you know, it, 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 you're not, he looks very uncertain as to what to do. He looks uncertain as to like what his face should be doing. I'm not giving him any direction. So he's just really on his own. Um, and there are moments where it looks like he's either grimacing or maybe, you know, there's, it looks like it's, it's pleasurable. It, it's not quite clear. And it runs this whole spectrum mm -hmm. of, of um, facial expressions, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and also there's just like the floppiness of his limbs. Like he's <laughs> clearly, you know, not, um, let's say proficient at whatever it is that he's doing. And I really like that. You know, I like the, I, I like that the way in which this gives access to a, a sense of vulnerability or at least, you know, uncertainty. Um, and he does this, you know, in a number of instances throughout the video, which I really appreciated. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned uh, his, his facial expressions in that because I, I no, noticed that as well. He had the range from like pain to pleasure, but, it, but never for very long as if, he's not sure what he should be feeling and it's sort of independent of what he is feeling or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this, this thread of like sensuality, but also sexuality as, as two words that feel very like adjacent, but um, it's also something that specifically some of the participants like are at, at pains to sort of delineate I don't think I have a, a picture of that, but there are these like segments where um, you uh, there's a there's a question that's been asked off camera, but you don't hear the question, you just hear the answer, and it's the the men describing what they think, uh, what you know, I gather like what the definition of sensual is or what is sensual, um, and they most of them. Um, kind of define it in relation to sexual, um, which seems again like a theme, you know, from from the tunnel to the, the bull riding shots. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that that line or that boundary or the the way that you're um, sort of blurring it intentionally through these different. Um, fantasies, I guess, like, um, or, or using using the myth of the cowboy to kind of push at that boundary or using this little artificial situation of um, acting in a video to like push against um, where sensuality and sexuality uh, shift from one to the other. Yeah, I think for me, you know, in, in, in this project specifically, I try to use this word sensuous, um, which is, you know, actually different from sensuality, but, you know, um, either of those two things is a way to complicate how, not only how these men are represented, you know, which is, you know, a, that could be like a whole other topic of discussion, the representation of, of Asian American men in, in popular culture. But also in the way in which um, these terms might help, I don't know, um, 
complicate identity in general, or you know, certainly the, the performance of masculinity, which I think so much of it depends upon an alienation of of an individual from their own body, from their own bodilyness, I guess. Um, the body, the physical body, um, and the pleasures perhaps that are derived from it as somehow off limits or, or you know, taboo in, in, in a certain way, or at least highly delineated. And I think a lot of the activities that I planned um, for my participants try to push against that, you know, um, try to play with that in ways that are not explicitly one thing or another. There's a, definitely a sort of kind of confusion and sort of playing with, um, playing with how, how some of these things feel or um, the affect of some of their gestures, um, even the kind of um, the tensions that are between them. Um, you know, I had someone when they were watching these scenes where the two men are speaking to each other, uh, he told me that it felt like an, uh, uh, someone's like first Tinder date or something, right? Where <laughs> this sort of awkward moment where two people are meeting each other in person for the first time and just sort of uh, uh, asking each other these sort of kind of boiler quite, boilerplate questions and, and getting these somewhat rehearsed responses. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so much of, of, of all my work, or at least, you know, the more recent video projects are about playing against um, the kind of scripting that we all sort of um, uh, are socialized into, let's say, and the way in which we're, we're, we're always performing or we're always rehearsing. Um, and I think, you know, the, the cowboy definitely represents one kind of, of, of scripting for, for a normative, normative masculinity. And so all of these activities are, in, are, are done in, in, in a way to kind of play with that and push it into a different kind of space or a different kind of effective register, either on their own or, or, or with another person. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, the cowboy thing is, is interesting um, because, well, I just wrote this, like, like there's the other, um, the other sort of like costume element are these shots of, you know, the men dressed up as a Chinese railroad worker, which is taken in a very different, it's a very different, um, they're, they're kind of static shots, they're way more atmospheric, there's no talking, like sometimes they look at the camera, sometimes they don't. It's a very different, um, very different feeling to those, those moments. And I wonder if you could speak to the, to that, to that contrast and sort of how, um, I mean, the cowboy is, is this quintessential Western figure, but not necessarily like, um, you know, feels to, you know, in, in that kind of myth feels a little different from, feels detached from um, the construction of the railroad, right? Like they mm -hmm. rob trains or something, but they don't like build railroad tracks. Like um, you seem like two different um, ideas of the West, as, as you said. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wonder if you could talk about how that how that contrast plays out in um, in this in this set of this set of shots. Yeah. Um, so these shots were uh, uh, of Alfred, one of the participants. There's only one participant that dresses up as a railroad figure, and mm -hmm. this is the actually the very last thing that I shot. Um, and I was actually you know kind of hesitant to include this footage. You know, on the one hand, I want I thought that because you know my original idea was to never include an image of a railroad worker you know because i feel like we've already seen so many of these images or at least the images that we have seen are always sort of in this way where uh, uh, the the these men look very sort of pitiable you know they're always in tatters and and um, mm -hmm. there's a sort of um, intense not just objectifying of them but also this sort of intense disempowerment right that gaze that is that is uh, um, that is assumed between you know the photographer and the, and the subject is is really um, yeah one one of disempowerment I felt and so I was I was really nervous about um, including an image of the worker at all I thought I could just use the that voiceover and the, the tunnel and these other things to kind of suggest that uh, without ever having to explicitly describe this figure but. At the same time, I thought that, you know, there was something important about just seeing this person, even though, again, it's, it's another performance, right? It's 
one of one of my participants is dressing up. Um, there was something important about seeing this 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 person in contrast to all the sort of the cowboy stuff. Um, a character that deserves sort of dignity or respect, um, but also I don't know. I, I'm hoping that in the in the video anyway that it has a kind of emotional weight that again we we would normally never sort of apply uh, uh, to these individuals when we see them, you know, represented, you know, if at all. Um, so maybe this is the one where this is one instance where it, it is very much about. Um, a calculation about representation and, and wanting to include something that would otherwise um, be swept away or I don't know, um, like an image that would continue to speak to a certain kind of disempowerment. Um, I really wanted to create like this very dreamy sort of emotionally laden um, association with this character mm -hmm. versus one again that was just about pity and um, and lack of agency, let's say. Yeah, I know we're, I think we're almost time to take some questions. Um, but I want to bring thing. I, I want to bring in some of your other work just um, briefly in terms of, um, I guess two things, like two sort of kind of shifts uh, over the years. Uh, this, this piece, the sort of Craigslist pieces where you were um, putting yourself in these situations um, over over Craigslist. Uh, it was like 2011, 2012, something like that, right? This is 2010. 2010. Um, so I mean, there's certain like difference in production values, but I think the main the main thing is like the difference between you putting yourself in these situations and then, you know, gradually or in different, you know, um, more recent work, stepping behind the camera and kind of directing groups of other men, even though the dynamics, you know, these questions of like intimacy and touch and like male relationships. Um, I mean, in this piece in particular, um, but also maybe you know, picture of the one with your, your dad. Um, you know what where that where that shift comes from and and how the work feels different when you're on one side of the camera or the other yeah i mean i get i get asked this a lot and it is a, it is a big shift um i will say that i i think you know um actually beginning with that earlier image of, of the, the box encounter i felt that um you know these early Craigslist works were about putting myself in a, in a, in a situation where I was very vulnerable. Um, again, none, none of these encounters were scripted or rehearsed in any way. So it was about um, allowing the camera to capture some kind of spontaneous um, event that, um, that was about the tension of, of two strangers coming in, you know, coming into a space and doing something with one another. And again, very focused on the body. Um, and after a certain point of doing these, I realized I could no longer be in the same space of, of, of vulnerability um, because I, I felt like I had already, you know, on a very simple level, challenged myself to the point where I, I could walk into any number of situations and not actually, you know, even though it looked perhaps like I was um, doing something challenging, um, it actually became a kind of performance. Right, that like um, there was a certain knowability to that unknownness, you know, um, that like I could I could I could steal myself in some way, and and and, and, and um, these these situations almost felt um, uh, I don't know there, there was there was something lacking about stepping into these situations after a while. So it, me being in front of the camera no longer had the same kind of weight. Um, and mm -hmm. so the last, the last video where I'm actually, you know, again, in front of the cameras with my father and, you know, that was, that's a very different situation. You know, this, this person who on, on one hand, I know quite well, 
but another I actually don't know at all, right? So there is, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, he's still kind of a stranger to me, but of course, you know, he's my father, and uh, that I think that necess that necessitated um, me being in front of the camera, um, even though you know the stakes are quite different than when, than you know when I was work doing those earlier Craigslist works. Um, but yeah, I think I think me. But you know, also I will say that, like, even though I'm behind the camera, I would I would hope that you know some of my own particularities do come out. Not that any of my participants are surrogates for myself. I never sort of think of them in that way. They're not like my puppets or anything, or even like representations of myself. But I would hope that through the kind of awkward engagements with the body, that somehow you know I can still see or the audience can still see me somewhere with, you know, in, in front of the camera. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but without having to, my body be explicitly there in that situation. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, some of the questions are the same from like, from like breakfast in bed, which is the one where you, you know, have the men in this kind of basement type set doing these other you know kind of funny activities um they you all they also do this exercise that the cowboys do where they compliment each other um if i remember correctly they say things like you're a handsome guy you seem intelligent like they ha they have these kind of awkward moments of like staring one another in the eye and delivering a, a compliment they would never give another man to his face <laughs> so yeah there, there are these um these, these, yeah, these similarities and and the way the different videos push push the boundaries. Um, I wanted to ask you, though you're you're filming before COVID, but there seems like in silent silent spikes, like much less physical touching between the participants as maybe in some of the other videos, like Breakfast in Bed in particular, there's like a conga line. There's like these different um, ways that the, the, the men are um, asked to you know, be like physically, or like, you know, push, the, push their comfort level with physical closeness um, in a way that doesn't happen in silent spikes. And I wonder if that was, if that was deliberate or, or what the, the idea was there, even, you know, and especially in relation to this, you know, image of the tunnel and pressing against the tunnel in this very, uh, um, you know, the idea of touch is there a lot, um, but just not, you know, the actual touch. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good observation. Um, I don't think that was intentional on my part. Um, I do think that, you know, one way in which I activate the body of not through sort of this physical touching between the participants, but very much so in silent spikes is the use of sort of movement, not quite dance, but a lot of the scenes involve the participants doing abstract movements with each other. Um, certainly the movement from the, 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 the drop barrel. Um, there are these scenes where the men are just um, standing, but also doing or mimicking um, the, the bull riding movements in slow motion. Um, and, it, and then there's these other scenes that don't involve a participant, but a, an actual dancer, um, he appears whenever there's a shot of the tunnel or the voiceover. And, and that's an, a whole other thing that I, I really was interested in incorporating um, semi -chore unchoreographed or semi choreographed movement, again, as a way to bring in, as a way to activate the body um, to think about the sensuous, to think about perhaps how movement can can uh, uh, activate um, solidarities, let's say, um, or even just you know again playing with the cowboy and how um, how these again these these hyper masculine movements can be made to uh, represent something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, glad you brought about these uh, the shots with the dancer it's also a moment where you're kind of brought into the present day or into like an urban environment in a way that's really striking um you know you're kind of out of the the space of fantasy and myth here you're just like or maybe in a different one i don't know 
Um, but I think it's time for audience questions. Well, I've been monitoring the Q&A box and I don't see a question yet. We have a few minutes before we close, but uh, you just answered my question because I was wanting to address this, this part of the video that had the dancers and, and a lot of those um, moments that involve dance or choreography. Um, so thanks for that. This has been a really wonderful and thorough overview of, of Silent Spikes. And um, I just want everyone to come to ICALA and see it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I want to see it too. I have I actually have yeah, a yeah, We especially want you to come and see it. So, um, and Travis. So I don't know. I'm just checking. Anybody have any questions before we say until next time? We're getting some nice um, comments from everyone. So we can enjoy that as we close out. Okay. So Travis, thank you for collecting all of those stills um, <laughs> to illustrate this conversation. And um, we will have welcome everyone to ICALA and um, hope to see you both soon back in town. Thank you all for coming. And this, somebody asked if this is recorded. It is recorded and it will be posted soon. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks Travis, thanks Oscar. Good to talk, good to talk. Yeah, good seeing you Travis. Yeah, you too. All right, bye y'all. Good night.